Section 5.1 is addition and subtraction of integers. And so the first thing we're going to talk about is what is an integer. So an integer, sometimes you'll help you hear people describe it as positive and negative whole numbers. Have you ever heard that phrase before? Um, your book uses I for integers. Just so that you're aware, some books use the letter Z. Um, and there's a good reason for it, and it has to do with um, the Latin for the word comes from the Z. It actually is a letter Z. But um, also because integers with I has other problems because there's other I's that are number systems like irrational or imaginary. Or imaginary. And so I is just not a good notation to use because it has duplicate meanings. Um, but your book uses I, so we're going to use I. Um, when we list them out, you usually see a triple dot at the beginning of this, indicating that you can go left forever, and then a comma. You have negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, and 3, and then another three dots. So it goes in both directions forever, positives, negatives, and 0. Integers also include the number 0. So basically what we just did is we've been working for a really long time now in whole number systems. Chapter 3 and Chapter 4, all of it was completely whole numbers. So we had no negatives, right? So basically what we did is we took our world and we just expanded it a little bit to include the negative values. And I don't know about you, but I remember being in about second grade and the first time somebody asking me, and I don't think it was a teacher, I think it was some cocky, you know, other second grade little boy, <laughs> saying something silly like, what do you get when you take 2 minus 5 then? And you're going... We can't do that. We can't do that because there's not enough, right? Well, once you have negative numbers, you can do that. You can expand your world to include those numbers. I'm going to show you several models on how you can talk about why this works to children because um, it's not, the models that I'm going to show you are not like time saving, effective, you know, in terms of, of actually doing long, long volume problems or something like that. We're not, we're not doing like 542 minus 376 or something like this with these models. That's not the point. The point is the conceptual understanding from where the quicker methods come from, okay? So the first one's called the chip model. And what the chip model does is the chip model uses poker chips, okay? That's what they really use. And the ones that are actually created for classroom use are really cool because they have black on one side and they're red on the other side, okay? And we like using black and red because black is what is commonly used like in Microsoft Excel at the bank, right, for being positive. You're in the black, okay? And red, it's negative good, and that's exactly what's used inside of most um, operating system programs for accounting and stuff as well. So what I'm going to use is I'm going to use, if you have with you um, a pen or pencil that's not the color you're using right now, grab it out. It doesn't matter necessarily if it's, a, if it's specifically red. Um, so pen, pencil, marker, crayon, something, okay? So you're going to need two colors if you're going to do this um, sort of the easiest way possible. So I'm going to use red, and this is going to be my negatives, and I'm going to use red actually on my t writing too, just so that we have it very clear. So this is a negative chip. And then I'm going to have a black chip that's going to be my positive chips. Okay, so far so good? Okay, this problem is an addition problem, right? I have adding a positive number and I have a negative number that I'm adding together. So what I do inside of this um, problem is first I draw a circle. Okay, so draw yourself a circle. And inside your circle, you're going to put five black chips because it says five and that five is a positive. Five black chips. And you're going to add to it, so you're going to put into the circle, three negative chips because it says there's supposed to be three negatives. And a positive chicken and a chip and a negative chip, they balance each other out. They're worth the same amount. It's like saying, I have a dollar in my pocket and I owe Ashley a dollar. Well, the debt balances out the money I have in my pocket, right? It's a balance. So every pair of these that you have a positive and a negative for can be removed. So you pair up the positives and negatives and you take them out of the circle and you literally do it just like this. If you were really doing it in the classroom with children, of course, they would have some sort of a desk or whatever in front of them or maybe they would even have a paper on the desk or a circle on their desk. And they would have these in here and they would physically, right, this is that kinesthetic learner stuff, take out the two chips that match one at a time. Are you with me? And the question is, once they're done and once you're done, because we're doing sort of a visual model of this, 
Once you're done, what is left inside your circle? Two black chips. And the answer is two. Okay, so this is the chip model. There's a variation of the chip model. It's the next one called the charged fields model. Any questions on this one before I do that one? Bridget. We, when we're teaching this, do we need to emphasize that it's positive too? Like, should we say the answer is positive two, or is it okay just to say two? Um, it's okay to say two. You could put a positive in front of it to further emphasize it. It'd be okay. Um, but basically the idea is that if we don't put a sign in front of it, it's always positive. It's kind of like when we did base 10 numbers, when we don't put the subscript in, that's the understood subscript. So it's kind of your choice. You might do that more at the beginning if you were talking about this with kids and less as you go on. And also just so that you're aware of, of age level for integers, integers usually hit at fifth or sixth grade depending on the content uh, curriculum you're using, just so you know, okay? Okay, charge fields model. I've got the same exact expression I had before. Um, you don't necessarily need colors for this. You could use them if you'd like. But the idea is that we're going to use symbols of the positives and symbols of negatives. So when we see the five, we're going to write five pluses. And we see the negative, we're going to write three negatives. And again, a charge, you know, a balance of a positive charge and a negative charge balance each other out. So we're taking the pairs of things that balance and we're removing them. This is less um, kinesthetic because you're not actually using poker chips. The other one is actual poker chips. Like that's, they, they make these manipulatives. I think it's cheaper to buy the poker chips, just to be honest. Um, one of the things that I have had a teacher do before too, um, a colleague that I had when she would teach this, is that she had purchased, I think it was the black poker chips, and she'd purchased red dot stickers so that she put the stickers on one side so she could do the cheaper version of actually purchasing the items because when they put the phrase math manipulatives on them, they charge you more, right? You guys know that. And so she'd used what she could get as a cheaper option, and then she created them to actually serve her purpose better. This one doesn't have that feature to it. This is not a hands-on activity. But it does have that positive-negative balance feel to it, which is very friendly, um, especially as kids are thinking about this in terms of science, potentially, and those charges, like actual charges of positive and negative charges of things. Um, so that's kind of friendly. Um, so on this one, you would do the same thing in terms of your version of the ending of it. You would draw another circle that only has what's left over in it. You know, so it's almost like the circle on your left is your work, show the work. The circle on the right is the answer, um, or at least the cleanup form of the picture for it. And then the answer, of course, is two. There's two more models. The next one is the number line model. Okay, so number line model actually is a number line. So we're going to draw ourselves a number line. Oops, this is the one I want. And the first value tells you where you start on the number line. So I mean, you have to mark the number zero to actually have a place to start for five. So here's where you start five. Okay, so this has another, um, I'll draw it first and I'll show you the kinesthetic version of what you can do with this. So you're starting at five, and then this is telling you you're adding negative three. So when you add, you're still, you're still moving the direction, but this is in the negative direction, so you're going to go, if you will, backwards on the number line. One, two, three, which means you end here at two. Let me show you the kinesthetic version of this. Can you imagine putting a piece of tape on your floor? Can you do that? Sure. And could you make that tape the number line? Absolutely. So I don't have tape on the floor, but I'm going to use your desks, consider, consider your desks like my numbers on the number line, okay? So right here, I'm at the origin. I'm at zero, and I'm supposed to be over here at five. So here I'm at one, two, three, four, five, okay? And I'm supposed to add negative three. So I'm going to go one, two, three. I'm right here when I'm done. And the question is, how far am I away from the original starting space? And the answer is two. But I'm still on the positive side of the number line, so it's positive 2 is my answer.
how do you like use these but then like connect them to doing like a faster method later because I learned this but I mean I was probably in middle school and I was still like drawing number lines on my We can talk about that when we get finished with the conceptual part of this. We tend to focus more on the conceptual part of these because Mm -hmm. that's usually where the students struggle is Mm -hmm. with why the methods work but there are some mnemonic devices um, Mm -hmm. that will also allow you to do it quicker and we can talk about that when we get there. Yeah. To um, have if we teach this, because I remember whenever I was in sixth grade, we had like on like the concrete outside of our mm-hmm. deal, our school added a painted number line, and I remember like being out there messing with it. Like, is that something that would be really helpful? I think it's really helpful for some students. Okay. I mean, you know, it, we all learn and think differently, mm-hmm. so the number line is going to just really pull at some of your kids, and it's really just not going to care. I mean, some of your kids are just not going to care about it at all. They're going to be like, "This is dumb." Let's be honest, right? They are. Some of your kids are going to be like, this is dumb. Um, It just depends on the kids that you have. Um, The other thing, too, is that um, if you can figure out which of those kids that are struggling with whatever method you're using in your book or whatever, you can actually pull those kids that are struggling and introduce other methods that maybe your book's not, you know, not prevalent in showing or whatever um, so that that it can hit them where it's, it's maybe more helpful for them. Okay, one more method. Um... I really like the pattern method. Most of you are probably not going to. That's okay. But let me show you how the pattern method works. What the pattern method does is it establishes the fact that you know some facts about addition of positive numbers. For example, if you were to add 5 plus 2, that answer is 7. But if you were to add 5 plus 1, that answer is Six, this is a prior knowledge issue. And if you did five plus zero, again, all whole numbers, you'd get five. Okay, this is something that all the kids would already know because they've already dealt with whole numbers to a great degree. In fact, substantially more at the point when they hit this because they've probably been doing multiplication with three-digit numbers at this point, okay? So this is not a difficult thing at this point for them to be like, yeah, obviously, but what does it matter? Well, the cool thing is that all you're going to do is you're going to decrease the numbers by one over here on the left until you get to the one that you care about, which ours is negative three, okay? So the pattern's continuing along the second, if you will, kind of column of the numbers here. All the fives are staying the same. Two, one, zero, negative one, negative two, negative three. Everybody see the pattern? What's the pattern happening over here? I have six, five, a seven, six, five. What's the next number in the pattern? Four, Four. and then three. three, and then two. And from a pattern perspective, that's where I wanted to end up. Some kids think in patterns. Think about some of your special needs kids like Asperger kids. Patterns are big time with those kids, right? So this is gonna really appeal to some kids and then some of the kids are gonna look at you and think you're stupid. This is what teaching is. I know, some of you look at me and think I'm stupid sometimes too. It's okay, I don't, I don't uh, hold it against you. Okay, Let's take a look at one other fact in here, and then we will pause. We're going to do one other set of examples, okay? Absolute value. You guys have seen this before as well. This comes up in um, integers because absolute value is the first time we actually have negative numbers to talk about. Absolute value says that if you have any integer x, then the absolute value of x is equal to x when x is greater than or equal to 0, and the absolute value of x is negative x when x is less than 0. And I usually have people get a little weirded out right there. Okay, I still have my very large print on from that. Let's try that again. Right here. I don't like that. Because probably somewhere someone along the way told you that the absolute value of every number is positive. Agreed? And they told you the truth. That's that's a true statement. Um, A better description, though, of absolute value is that it's really a distance. It's a distance back to zero. So if you're a positive value away from zero, it's a positive number. But if you're a negative value away from zero, it's still a positive distance. Now here's the catch, and here's why this definition actually says negative over here. So think with me for a moment. If you had, say, a negative 5, okay? What's the absolute value of negative 5? It's 5. We all know that, right? Well, this definition, what it actually says is to take the opposite of the value negative 5. Well, what is the opposite of negative 5? Positive 5. So that's why this definition works, is because this doesn't mean a negative. It means the opposite of. 
And the opposite of a negative number is a positive number. That's why the definition is described like that. So it would probably be a good idea for you to write down that this negative means opposite of. And that's really what negatives always mean. Um, but in this particular situation, it's helpful to think about it that way. So we're going to do example five together, and then we'll pause and we'll do group work from the last section. Example five actually is a true-false, and it says that if it's false, we're going to show a counterexample. All right, so here's the first one. It says classify the following as true or false, false to a counterexample. Absolute value of x to the fourth is equal to x to the fourth. That is a true statement. Um, and the reason it is true, it doesn't ask us to write this down, but if you'd like to jot it down, you can. The reason it's true is because x to the fourth, the part that's inside the absolute values, is a positive number, always. Why? And what's special about the four, Leah? It's even. Even powers keep things positive, correct? So no matter how many negatives you have, if you multiply them by themselves an even number of times, they become positive. So this is always a positive number inside this absolute value. So when I take the absolute value of it, it doesn't change. It fits into the first category on this slide. It is positive already, so we can just remove the absolute values. B's not. It's a power that's odd. There must be something unique about that, because I gave it to you after the even one, right? This statement is false. I don't, I'm not asking you for the why right now. I'm asking for a counterexample. Can you give me an example that shows this does not work? In other words, the question is, what would x have to equal? Yes. It has to be a negative number. Okay, and can you give me a negative number, Ariel? Negative two. Negative two. Okay, so if x is negative two, then the absolute value of negative two to the fifth, I'm sorry, I put that wrong, to the fifth like this, and then the absolute value, and then just negative two to the fifth. This is what we're sort of questioning is whether or not these guys are the same, correct? So what is negative two to the fifth? It is negative 32. So I've got negative 32 in absolute values on the left. I've got negative 32 not in absolute values on the right. The problem is that the left-hand side of this, when I actually take the absolute value of negative 32, what do I get? I get positive 32. And positive 32 does not equal negative 32. And all the way along here, I kind of should have these sort of question marks above my equal sign. I'm trying to find out, is this a true statement? And the answer, of course, is no. But you can do exponents with negative. Sure. Mm -hmm. You can do eps, eps, or, uh, exponents of negative numbers, definitely. Sometimes they stay negative and sometimes they change to positive. It depends on what the exponent is. All right. Absolute value of x is not negative. What do you think? It's true. This is a true statement. Let me get to the next answer, and then we'll talk about both of them because they kind of go together. Absolute value of x is positive. That one is false. So how in the world can the first one be true and the second one be false? The fact that it's like not negative and it kind of feels like a double negative. Nope, but that's a good notice. Isn't that like the same thing? If something's not negative, it's positive. Is that true? No, it could be zero. There you go. It could be zero, right? Zero is a third option. Is zero positive? No. Is zero negative? No. So the counterexample on part D is zero. Zero is neither. Right? And because it is neither, it is not always positive. And it's a good thing for me to actually come into this as well because occasionally I have somebody who thinks that this is not possible. What is the absolute value of zero? It is zero. Right? It's like saying, what's the distance from me to myself? Well, I mean, like, it's a weird question, right? But zero. Zero. I don't have to go anywhere if I want to be right here. I'm already here. Um, and then the fact that it's not negative, um, remember here, the whole, the whole issue is that we're talking about distance. And it's true that distance cannot be negative. Negative is a direction. And it gives us indication of direction, but not of distance. 